Welcome to the Noble Network College Fair. My name is Jasmine. I'm going to serve as the facilitator for our session today. We have an amazing list of presenters joining us. Each presenter will have approximately six minutes to share information about their institution. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping announcements. The first announcement, your camera and microphone are off. So our presenters are unable to see or hear you. Second announcement, you can use that Q&A feature in Zoom to type your questions to our presenters at any point throughout our session today. Third announcement, this is just one of a few different sessions that we're offering. So feel free to visit our registration site to sign up for additional sessions. And finally, this presentation is being recorded and you can access this recording by visiting strivescan.com slash N-O-B-L-E. With all that said, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to our first presenter from Agnes Scott College. Hi everyone, my name is Faith Rashidi Yaz and I am super happy to be joining all this morning and sharing some more information about Agnes Scott College. I am an admission counselor here at Agnes Scott and I use she, her pronouns. Jumping right into it, I think um, a great place to kind of start to learn some more information about Agnes Scott College is our mission statement. Um, the mission of Agnes Scott College is to educate students to think deeply, live honorably, and engage in the social and intellectual challenges of their times. So this is really where we move from as a campus community. This has been our mission statement for quite a long time, but I really love how it is um, calling our students to really um, be agents for for change um, and be really intellectually curious about the challenges of their times um, and really be leaders in, in every sense of the word. Some highlights of our campus community. If you were to visit us on campus, we are located in Decatur, Georgia. It's about 15 minutes outside Atlanta, Georgia or Midtown, downtown Atlanta. Um, so definitely in the South, which is super awesome. Um, we have just over a thousand students who call Agnes Scott home. They come from 41 states and 12 countries. 62% um, of our students identify as students of color and 32% are first in their family to attend college and we have some awesome support and resources for our first generation students on campus. We are an inclusive women's college so Agnes Scott admits students who are assigned female at birth as well as those who are assigned male or female and now identify along the gender spectrum. We are an inclusive, or excuse me, we have a liberal arts curriculum, so um, you can take STEM courses, humanities, as well as art courses, um, kind of in that classroom experience. And we also have six varsity sports if you're interested in playing sports. A little bit about that classroom experience. Here at Agnes Scott, we have 34 majors and 31 minors. Um, you can really see kind of that breadth of the liberal arts experience represented in some of our top majors. We do have three dual degree programs, um, two with Emory in computer science and nursing, and one with Georgia Tech in engineering. And then we have six graduate degree programs here on our campus, as well as some master's pathways for students looking to extend their education past that undergraduate level. What ultimately um, help set Agnes Scott apart is our signature summit experience. So moving from our higher level mission statement, um, we feel it's really important that students have practical skills to live out that mission statement on the day to day. So summit itself is kind of the overarching framework that students are taking part in during all four years of their time at Agnes Scott. Um, it's broken down into three major themes, global learning, leadership development, and professional success. For that first theme, global learning, we really think that being a global citizen um, starts in the classroom with learning globally. And the kind of flagship piece of this theme is a 
journey, a global journey that students take um, during their first year here at Agnes Scott, which includes a seven to 10 day travel piece where students are really kind of going all across, across the globe. Um, and this um, global journey is generously funded by donors, so no added cost to students. Um, they just need to cover the cost of a passport if they're able. The next theme, leadership development, is really about kind of students reflecting on who they were in high school, what type of leader they are, how they're coming to Agnes Scott, and who they want to be during their time at Agnes Scott and then beyond, really kind of plugging into the support systems um, that we have here on our campus to help them create a definition of leadership that fits well with who they are. Um, and the final important theme, professional success, is about thinking of your time after Agnes Scott, making sure you're set up with skills to succeed after you graduate from Agnes Scott. A little bit about um, the application or admission process and financial aid. We are Common App exclusive school, um, so you can apply to us through the Common App. We have no application fee for domestic, undocumented, undocumented and DACA students. We have a holistic review process here at Agnes Scott, so we really want to get to know you as a student. Um, and we are a test optional institution. We have been for about over 10 years. We have merit scholarships in the range of twenty to $26,000, and our scholarship priority deadline is January 15th. We do work with the FAFSA for need-based aid here at Agnes Scott, and we have some special scholarships um, that are available on our website as well. I would love to stay connected with y'all. I'll be here to answer any questions if you wanna put them in the Q&A, um, but you can scan this QR code um, to see some of our visit opportunities that we have um, both in person on our campus as well as virtually, and feel free to follow us on all of our social media. Um, and that is all the information that I have for y'all today. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Faith. Our next presenter is from St. Mary's College. Hi everyone, my name is Ana Martinel Campo. I am a proud St. Mary's grad, uh, 2015 from St. Mary's College. Um, it, I'm actually from Mexicali, Mexico, and I ended up going to St. Mary's, not only because it's an all women's college, but also because of the community, because it really made me, um, and made me understand, uh, thank you for that. It made me understand that I was not only part of a family, but that I also was challenged throughout my four years. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in my personal experience and my transition throughout St. Mary's, uh, but let's just give you a little overview. So we are a small private Catholic Women's College liberal arts as well. We're about 1600 students, whereas 68% come from out of state. Um, as you can see right here, we have a little picture of Chicago close to Notre Dame because we're actually of a drive an hour and 45 minutes. We're currently accepting um, students to visit our campus, which as you saw is absolutely outstanding. The reason why you see so many trees is because the architecture who designed the campus in itself had a vision to recreate it like Central Park in New York. So you'll see like it's an enchanted forest almost when you go between your dorm to your to the dining hall to maybe the science department. So it's it's a very beautiful campus. Um, we have students, 20% of our students come from underrepresented populations and 20% of our students are first generation like myself. So for academic excellence, one, why would you attend an all women's college? Why would you like an individual experience? And what does that look like? Um, an individual experience means that your average class size will be about 16. It means that you will be challenged, that these are conversation-based classes, that you will learn how to use your voice, no matter the audience, no matter the place, no matter the career of your choice. Specifically, we prepare you for those majors that are very mentally dominated, such as um, engineering, such as business, such as law. I mean, there's so many careers out there where we want to continue empowering women to be where you need to be and be confident in yourself. So this is why the individualized experience is the professors really get to know you to understand your full potential. Uh, one of the biggest examples that I have as a St. Mary's alum is that when I was at St. Mary's, my dad would always tell me, you should do business because that's the only way that you can get a job after school. 
little did I know as a first gen student that there were more than 50 plus majors at St. Mary's that I could choose from. But because my dad told me that this was the only way to get a job, I was very, very stubborn to do that until my professors told me, you know what, Anna, you're trilingual, you started abroad, you came back, you have all these assets, why don't you do something like global studies? And then I thought, why would my professors go out of their way to really care for me? And that's when I understood that St. Mary's meant community, meant family. And it meant also that after four years, that I also didn't have a job lined up my senior year. And they said, Anna, we think you'd be a great candidate for grad school. Again, first gen didn't know I had that option. And this is where I'm coming from. The professors already had written letters of recommendation for me in pamphlets of great grad school programs for me so that I could start applying. And these are the types of things that I say, when you're looking for a college, if it's in a smaller environment, if it's a women's college that you're choosing, I think St. Mary's is one that will go above and beyond to make sure you're okay, not just your four years, but you're prepared and lined up with something after you graduate. So these are our most po popular programs, as you can see. Nursing is our number one. We just had a brand new building open up October. So if you're into the health sciences or nursing, I strongly encourage you to come visit campus. Um, our most unique, I do want to talk briefly about our engineering four plus one program. In five years, you graduate from both the University of Notre Dame and St. Mary's College. So the benefits of attending a women's college, and you'll hear um, a little bit about this from all of us, but um, there's these facts, right? And that not only we prepare you for a future, not only we prepare you to be a well-rounded person, but we also see the facts that 81% of students who attended a women's college said that they felt prepared for their job versus 65% of them, and also versus 51% of students who attended a women's college completed a grad degree versus 27% of them. So student life at campus, because we are a tri-campus community, we are beside the University of Notre Dame. We share 500 plus clubs and organizations, uh, service about 80 plus, 80% 80 plus of our students are continuing to be committed to, uh, to service our and the community. We are division three athletic uh, and for study abroad, about 50 plus percent of our students. 50% plus of our students study abroad because your financial aid award package actually transfers directly to your study abroad program, which means you don't need to pay anything extra. Um, so the results are that 94% of our students are always uh, participating in internships and field experiences, uh, and 95% really are employed um, or in graduate school within one year of graduation. For the application process, most students apply regular decision. The application deadline is February 15. Deposit deadline is May 1st. 100% of our students do receive financial aid and our merit award scholarships go range from $20,000 to $34,000. We are test optional. And for staying engaged, as I said, we are offering on-campus tours. You will be receiving a $500 visit award if you visit St. Mary's. And I hope to um, see you soon on campus. Thanks again for learning and being here. Thank you. Our next presenter is from Mount Holyoke College. All right, can you see my screen okay? We can. Excellent. All right, good uh, morning, everyone. My name is Ariel Lawson. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm an assistant director at Mount Holyoke College. Um, I'm just excited that everyone is in this room and engaging with our institutions because you can really do no wrong when it comes to thinking about women's colleges as a, as a place where you'll spend your four years for college. So just excited to have you all in this virtual space. Um, a little bit about who we are at Mount Holyoke. Uh, we are in the Connecticut River Valley of Western Massachusetts, so just about three hours from New York City, about an hour and a half west of Boston. Massachusetts is kind of like a long state. Um, and so we have a really beautiful place where we have a lot of greenery, a lot of trees, a lot of lakes on campus. Um, we have a lot of, you can see trails here. So we have an equestrian center on campus. So you'll often see community members walking their dogs. And it's really, um, well, as a smaller town, it is really nice to feel that sense of community and warmth and welcome whenever you step foot on our campus. I'll talk in a little bit about our larger college community community. Um, you might have heard some patterns where a lot of our institutions are really strong on their own and have partnerships with local colleges to enhance what we already have. So I'll talk about our five colleges in just a little bit, um, but I'm really excited to just highlight the intellectual acuity of our students and their interests and just um, how broad their interests and experiences are as well. Oops. 
All right. Um, so thinking about who we are, right, I said we're in Western Massachusetts, um, right, but we're not just a town of folks from Western Massachusetts. Our students come from all over the world and all over the country. Um, we have just about 2,200 students and even two students from the same exact town are going to come with different experiences, different identities that are salient to them. Um, and we really celebrate that. So you can see on here, we have a few statistics, but what I want to point out is the programming that we have on our campus. We have six cultural centers. Um, the first that I'll highlight is our Betty Shabazz, which is our oldest. It's been around for 52 years um, and it is our center. It's named after um, the wife of Malcolm X, Dr. Betty El Shabazz. Um, and uh, it is for our students of African diaspora or African descent. Um, and we have centers for our Asian American students, for our indigenous students, um, for our queer students. Um, we also have a religious center uh, for those who are interested in exploring their faith. Um, and so we really celebrate all of our students and are always excited to, to see them fully in all of the ways that they are. Um, we also have a resource center for our first gen and low income students. Um, and one of the most powerful pieces I think about being a part of our community is that we celebrate these student identities, but we also celebrate these identities in our faculty and staff. And so if there's programming for first gen students, you might see a number of faculty and staff there. If there's programming for our queer students, you might see faculty and staff there. And so community inclusion, when we're thinking about it, we're thinking about it from our student perspective, but also how can the adults in their lives, how can the staff and faculty also show up in that way? Um, right, why a woman's college, right? It's, it's really niche, right? There are so many like larger state in institutions or larger universities that are co-ed, like what is so special about this woman's college experience? Um, and I think, right, some of it's listed here, some of it my colleagues have said and my colleagues who come after me will say as well or reiterate is that it's really about every single opportunity being at your feet. It's about getting the support to know that you have those opportunities, right? Um, as my colleague Anna just was mentioning, right? Being reminded you have this power to go to grad school, to do all of these things, to take advantage of internship or study abroad opportunities, um, and being in a, in a gender diverse woman space um, is about being reminded of those opportunities, um, having those front row learning experiences, and just having the social engagement um, to feel confident and feel empowered in all of the ways that you are and all of the ways that you are becoming as well. Um, as I mentioned, right. This is about being a women's college, but it's also about just having, being in a small college community where students are intellectually curious, they're exploring their boundaries academically, but also socially. And so getting into deep conversations about sometimes difficult topics and really pushing each other to dig deeper and to have those really robust conversations and come out with a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more perspective as well. Um, and thinking about that on a global scale. And so, right, as I mentioned, almost 83 countries are represented in our student body um, and even more across our faculty and recognizing how our folks coming into our community with different perspectives or different understandings of culture um, and how can we make that sort of to our benefit. Um, we are love, of course, to support our students and to support them in all aspects of their academic interests, making sure that they are then prepared um, to go on to graduate programs or to be competitive in applicant pools for jobs. Um, and so we do have 48 majors, um, many minors as well, um, and the opportunity for students to self-design a major. Um, and so it's really exciting to see just how creative our students can get. Um, we have fantastic faculty. And one of the things that I mentioned, right, about being a community of inclusion is that our faculty, just like our students, choose to be here. Um, and that's the case for all of our institutions. And so you know that when you're opting into a women's college experience, your faculty is going to be there for a reason. They're going to be there because they want to engage with students like you. They want to engage with people who are front row learners, who are interested in exploring their boundaries. Um, and that's something that makes it so that you do have recommenders who are writing you letters when you graduate, or you can connect with someone even three years out of school. Um, and so that's something that's really powerful, that faculty mentorship I even still benefit from really close mentorship and, and, and friendships with faculty as well. Um, and so I'll just end um, with my uh, presentation here just to point out um, the ways that you can connect. Here's my email and I, I welcome you to connect with us virtually and to stay in touch with me and also all women's colleges here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter is from Bryn Mawr College. 
All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Keegan. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at Bryn Mawr College. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I work with all of our students from the Midwest and from China. So I want to start today talking about um, where Bryn Mawr. So we're part located in suburban Philadelphia. We have over 1,400 students um, that come from 47 different states, four territories, and 34 different countries. 15% um, of our students um, are international students. 32% will identify as students of color, and 13% will be the first in their families uh, to attend uh, college. Um, but while our students, I think, come from many different experiences and backgrounds, they do come to Bryn Mawr with a wonderful shared sense of living and learning values. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time, too, um, talking about Bryn Mawr as a women's college. Um, I know some of you are probably really excited about that. Um, some of you might be a, a little bit nervous about that, but I want to assure you um, that no matter where you fall, um, uh, you know, I think our students, it's fine. I think our students, when they were sitting where you were sitting, um, uh, maybe weren't considering Bryn Mawr because it's a women's college. Um, maybe they were looking at us for our educational opportunities. Um, but I think once they're here um, and experiencing um, uh, the empowering environment, they're so glad that they chose Bryn Mawr um, because it is a women's college. But as um, I, our identity as a women's college has evolved over the years, and so not all of our students on campus um, will identify as women. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about our academic program. So through our liberal arts curriculum, students are encouraged to take classes across the discipline. So we don't have a core curriculum where students take a math 101 or an English 102. However, we do want our students to be liberally educated. Um, and we ensure this by having students take classes in what are called our four modes of inquiry, which are critical interpretation, cross-cultural analysis, inquiry into the past, and scientific inquiry investigations. Um, they'll also take a foreign language while they're at Bryn Mawr, um, and they're expected to have some quantitative reasoning skills. But as you can see, there's so much flexibility um, for our students to explore those areas of interest, to find those passions, to try those classes both in your comfort zone and outside of your comfort zone um, before um, really declaring that major. Um, and you'll do that at the end of our sophomore year. Um, our, our classes are small. Um, we have a nine to one student faculty ratio and some of our most popular majors are math, psychology, English, biology, social, and sociology. Um, and I think one of the things, the themes that you'll hear today too is the success of our institutions in um, supporting students in the fields of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and we are awarding 2.6 times the national average of degrees to women in STEM, um, which I think is a pretty remarkable statistic. So Bryn Mawr is part of three academic and social consortia. So we're part of what's called the Bi-College Consortia with Haverford College. We're part of what's called the Tri-College Consortia with Haverford and Swarthmore College. And we're part of the Quaker Consortia um, with Haverford, Swarthmore, and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there's a blue bus that runs regularly to Haverford, um, a van that runs to Swarthmore, and then there's public transportation that will take students into the University of Pennsylvania. So not only do students have access to the courses um, at these other institutions, but we also share things like organizations, events, activities on campus, and in the case of Haverford, even meal plans will go back and forth. Um, so, but I think it's important to note that while it's great to have the consortia, you could also stay at Bryn Mawr um, for four years and have a completely comprehensive experience. So it doesn't speak to the lack on the part of any of the institutions, I think just this wonderful additional benefit. Um, I know that many of you are probably interested in studying abroad, and I think we're being able to do that more and more um, as, as um, COVID-19 restrictions um, begin to lift. Um, 
And we have over 90 pre-approved study abroad programs. Um, and if you go on a Bryn Mawr approved program, all financial aid will travel with you and your credits transfer back. So we do try to make that um, as seamless as possible. And most of our students will either go for a semester or for a year in that junior year, right after you've sort of declared your major and know how that will fit um, into your program of study. I also wanna highlight some of our curricular opportunities that are pretty unique. Um, one is our 360 course cluster program. It was designed by our president when she was the provost of the college to look at how do we make those connections across um, the disciplines? So it's taught by faculty who are really teaching that curriculum together around like a common theme. And then each cluster has a fully funded off-campus experience. Um, so an example of that, we had one that looked at called Coasts in Transition. Um, where students um, looked at the way coasts are impacted by rising sea levels um, and uh, climate change. Um, and then their group um, went on a fully funded experience to um, Belize um, and were uh, and had that as the field work there. We have over a hundred different clubs and organizations um, for students to join, including Rainbow Alliance, Sisterhood, um, Bacasso. We're also for sports and CAA um, division three. All right, and then a little bit of uh, uh, some of the outcomes um, for our students. I think we're really successful in, in helping students prepare for life after Bryn Mawr. Um, and then I do wanna just briefly mention, here's a link um, if you are interested um, in exploring some of our admissions and, and financial aid opportunities available um, to students as well. And then I will, if you get a chance, encourage you to visit um, or virtually visit like you're doing today. So um, here is my contact contact details just in case you do have any questions. Thank you. Our next presenter is from Swift's College. Hi, y'all. Um, so I'm here to finish us off. Um, with this wonderful set of women's colleges. Um, my name is Leanne Dominguez. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Associate Director of Admission for Diversity and Access Initiatives at Scripps College. I am also an alum, um, and I'm very excited to tell you all about my alma mater. My, my favorite thing about this experience, both as a student and, and now as a staff member, has been the opportunity to be able to grow my voice and grow into my voice and find my path while being surrounded by peers who I find to be inspiring, affirming, um, and grounding. Um, in terms of scripts and where we're located, uh, we are in Southern California, uh, about 35 miles east of LA in the area called the Inland Empire. Uh, we were founded in the 1920s by Ellen Browning Scripps, who was a journalist, a philanthropist, and a supporter of expanding access to higher education. Um, as a woman with a college degree herself, Scripps was the final achievement of our founder, um, which she actually founded when she was 91 years old. So she was uh, fighting the fight for quite a long time. Uh, and Scripps presents an opportunity and a freedom to learn with brilliant, bold people in a women or femme-centered environment that centers mentorship, support, and collaboration. Our community is, is quite small. We have a little bit over a thousand students and um, folks from all over, all over the country and the world. Um, and being in Southern California means that we get to enjoy an average daily temperature of 77 degrees, which does not apply today. We are in a very cold 68 degrees, um, which we in California are very spoiled by. Um, in terms of our community and academic opportunities, um, quite small in terms of class sizes, student to faculty ratio, we offer over 60 majors, both at Scripps and uh, the other Claremont colleges, which I'll get to at the end of my presentation. Um, but specifically for Scripps, our top majors range. Um, you can see, see them there listed. Um, quite a bit of our students major in the sciences, uh, kind of mirroring what, what someone, what one of my other co-presenters said, um, the support for pursuing STEM at a women's college is very much present and allows our students to learn a field they're really passionate about without having to have uh, gendered expectations or mansplaining occur. Um, Scripps is really known for its interdisciplinary curriculum. We attract students who like more than one thing. And so it's very common at Scripps to double or dual major or major and minor. We also offer pre-health and pre-law tracks for students, um, which enables you to major in whatever you want, but still be on a path to pursue either a career in the health professions or in law. 
In terms of career preparation, very similar to what some of my colleagues have said, um, most of our offices and our resources are influenced by the fact that we are women's colleges and for our career preparation office, um, they are tasked with making sure our students know how to navigate the professional world after graduating from undergrad and also doing so in, in likely male dominated fields. So what does that mean? It means knowing how to speak about yourself, how, how to advocate for yourself and others, how to create connections and networks that will propel, propel your, your movement forward in, in whatever you choose to do after undergrad. Um, and we're able to offer a variety of, of services for our students that are thinking about internships, about 80% of our students will complete at least one internship during their four years, or jobs or funding for unpaid internships, all of that is, is available through our CPNR office. In terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, this is something that's particularly important to me as a student of color, as a first gen student, as a queer student, um, and having navigated its scripts um, as a predominantly white institution. Um, first, the IDEA initiative is our long term historical document that provides the direction of our initiatives into making scripts a more inclusive and equitable space, while SCORE is a physical space um, on campus that essentially uh, functions as the social justice hub where intersectional identity based programming happens. Um, it's a place that I is very dear to my heart. And the first generation of Scripps program is something that didn't actually exist when I was a Scripps student, but it came to be my senior year. It's a program that I love to talk about because it supports our first gen community, which is about 15% of our community through pre-orientation. So first gen students are invited to move in a little earlier than everybody else to get acclimated to the college community and meet the other first gen staff and faculty. Um, and then it's, it connects them to the community and supports them through college or through graduation, which is pictured here. This is uh, some of the class members from the class of 2019. The five C's is what we unofficially call the consortium that Scripps is a part of, also known as the Claremont Colleges. This is a pretty neat setup of five undergraduate schools all within one square mile of land. That's the piece that makes our consortium different than any other consortium in the world because our students are able to fully take advantage of four other schools in addition to Scripps. Uh, socially, we share clubs, we share seven dining halls, we share evening life, parties, lectures. Um, academically, we share classes, majors, uh, faculty advisors. Um, it gets a little bit confusing. I won't get in the weeds, but essentially you can be a Scripps student graduating with a Scripps degree, um, but not limited to what Scripps is able to offer you. You're able to take advantage of what's available at the other schools while having this foundation really rooted in your success through a supportive and collaborative environment. Um, about a quarter of the majors we offer, we offer about 60, about a quarter of them are off campus. And basically if we don't offer the major you're interested in, then you would go, you would go off campus. We also share some shared facilities, uh, the library, the bookstore, large affinity-based spaces like the Office of Black Student Affairs, the Chicano Latino Student Affairs Office, the Asian American Resource Center, but each individual college also has its own set of resources for students. So there's a doubling of, of resources and support that exists for Scripps students. In out of campus life, this is the, the slide shows you kind of a mix of what's available at Scripps over on the left side and then what is available across the five cities over on the right side. Um, so lots of things to do. All of us are residents of colleges. Scripps specifically has 94% of our community living at Scripps and it is required um, for the first year. And we have lots of traditions. I have learned that women's colleges love their traditions. One of my favorite ones is, is what I'm using as my virtual background, which is the graffiti wall, which as a first gen student was pretty cool to put my name on a college's building, um, honoring my successes in the community that, that I had been a part of that had really um, helped me succeed. Um, so lots to do within, within the consortium. Together with the other colleges, we have about 6,000 students. And like I said, it's something that's day to day. Um, you, you, you see students from the other schools daily. The things that stay women's college are the residential living and three courses that Scripps students take um, while they're a Scripps student. Finally, here's my contact information. Uh, just a couple of things to know for you all. Scripps is permanently test optional. We promise to meet 100% of financial need as do the other Claremont colleges. And we offer optional interviews for juniors. They will be up on our website starting in May. Thank you all. Thank you. So that concludes the presentation portion of our session today. We're now gonna transition to the q and I want to encourage all of our presenters to return Feel free to turn on your camera and I will pose a question to the group. Our presenters will respond to the question in the order in which they presented. The question is, 
what advice would you give someone going through the college search process? So we will start with Agnes Scott. I think my biggest piece of advice is to really um, use the support systems around you that exist. Um, so whether it be family members that know you well, um, people, even friends at school, kind of um, have them give you feedback as you're going through the process. Um, I think it's really important to have some outside voices, some people who know you really well, kind of give input um, on where they think you might really thrive. Um, so that would be my biggest piece of advice. Um, I would say that having so many colleges to choose from, to have such a, like a filter, what type of college are you looking for? Do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be in a college town? Uh, and I think that will summarize from the 100 choices that you have to where you would like to start. And then from there say, okay, where do I see myself when you start looking at these colleges? And reaching out to your counselors, I think that's the number one important thing. Some students have said, you know, sometimes I'm scared to send an email, but this is why we're here to open up, to tell you what we're all about. Some of us are alums and we love to share our experience with you and to understand that not every college is meant for you, but for you to understand and decide which one will be for you. I'd have to say, um, sort of building off of both of that, right, really figure out what works for you, but then also know that you are so powerful in this, in this process, and whether that's like figuring it out what you want to do and owning that, even if your parents want something different or your friends want something different, um, but then taking advantage of the resources to connect with us on campus, um, because we can't do any of the work that we do without you, without your interest, um, and our students and our communities wouldn't be what they are without students like you who come in and make us better. So know that you are the most valuable part of this whole process and that we're just here to support and celebrate you. Well, I am having trouble turning on my video. So Jasmine, I'm wondering if you might be able to help me with that um, so I can see everyone. Um, but I think the, the piece of advice um, that, and I'll, I think the piece of advice that I would say is to take those notes, um, to start a journal, to keep track. Um, this is a, you're starting the process today and maybe even earlier. And it will, depending on your sophomore or junior, it'll go on um, for the next few month or year or so. So keep notes. What did what impressed you about today? What did you get excited about? Um, and when you hopefully get a chance to come visit us as COVID light lessons and we're able to get you on our campuses, take those notes about how you felt on campus. What was exciting for you? Um, because I think that will help you find a, a college that'll be the best match for you. I would say all very similar things to my colleagues. I, I would just emphasize the fact that my colleagues and I are here because we are passionate about our schools, but we also care about you being fully informed during this process to be able to make a decision that's right for you. Um, so make us work, ask us questions, call us up. I know that's scary, but call us up, ask us, what's your favorite thing about your institution? What's your least favorite thing? What do you wish would change? Those kinds of answers really give you insight into the passions and values of the community. And don't talk to just one person. We offer a variety of ways to connect to our community, our students, interviewers. You may get different answers from different people depending on when they graduated or what, what their interests are. And just getting that fuller picture will help you um, in putting together that list and, and figuring out what your own values are because that may change from the beginning of this process to, to when you're actually deciding where you're gonna go to college. All right, next question here. What is one myth you like to debunk about the college admissions process? I think I would like to debunk the fact that, or the myth that people think it's supposed to be easy, that things are just supposed to fall into place, that you know exactly, you're gonna know exactly what you want, um, that, yeah, everything is just, um, magical and, and everything will fall into place so easily. Um, I do think that is the case for some students. Some students know exactly what they want um, and find the process really easily. Um, but 
I know from my personal experience and students that I work with that there are times that this process is really tough. Um, there are times when you have to make difficult decisions or you have to narrow down your list and, and things like that. Um, so I want to you know, put it out there that there are moments that are going to be tough and it is part of the process um, to go through those tough moments and you will come out and end up at a school that you really love, um, even if there are challenging moments that you have to go through. So when I was applying to college back in the day, I thought that what only what mattered was my GP and my test scores, that I was just a number, right? And then I realized that this was not true, that it mattered what I had done throughout my four years, whether I was working after school, whether I was doing something at home or volunteering, and that people were interested in reading my application and my essay, and they took the time, and that some letters are personalized given to your personal application. So at the end of the day, you're not just a number. And I want to tell you, you're not just your test scores or your GPA. You're a person who has done an immense, an amazing and immense job also to be where you are today. So talk to us about that. Tell us all about it because you're human and we want to hear about you. So I think that's a huge myth. I would like to say you're not a number, but you're a person. Yeah, I think um, another thing sort of to build off um, what Anna just said is um, there is no like perfect applicant for any of our schools, right? We're looking at all of the different pieces that you share with us, your transcript, but your essay, also your family engagement, your community engagement, what you think about yourself and how you identify all of those pieces really help us understand how you fit into our community. And so there's not one perfect way to be, there's not one perfect academic act or excuse me extracurricular activity to add and so really be who you are and express your curiosity and and interest in all the ways that are unique to you um, and know that that will be enough um, in 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 this process right it might not mean that you get the admission that you want from the perfect school right but it will mean that you do get an admission somewhere you get accepted somewhere and that um, it'll be based on who you are authentically. So don't try to sort of cater to what you think that we're looking for because there is no one, one kind of applicant or one perfect applicant that we're looking for. I think um, I'm going to I, I echo what my colleagues say. Um, and also, I think also, too, I'm going to be a little um, in the college admissions process. And I think Leanne spoke to this. Um, I want to speak a little bit about the interview and the sense that the interview isn't just a chance for us to get to know you. It's a chance for you to ask us questions. And I think um, sometimes you think going into an interview that you're going to get asked all the questions. And we do. We want to find out about you. But bring questions. Um, we want you to ask us questions. Um, so as you're preparing for those things, um, I think a myth is that that you're going to um, it's going to be a one way interaction in an interview. And I think at many of our institutions, that's just not the case. We want to hear how we can help you find out what you need. Um, and I'm going to put one more plug in for the application process too. And a myth is that right. The only writing that matters. This is a, a piece for me is in your personal essay. Pay attention to your writing across all the application, whether it be those supplemental essays, whether it be, we'll ask you to reflect on maybe COVID-19 and how that has impacted your experience. We'll ask you to reflect on an extracurricular. So the writing in the essay isn't the only piece we want to, we want you to take that same care throughout the writing um, in the application. So a little bit more um, uh, application myths I'd like to address. And um, my, my myth isn't really about the college application process, but um, more of a feeling that I felt and I know that peers um, of mine have also felt once I got to Scripps, once I got to college and I was in those first few classes, I felt like such an imposter. I felt like the admission office had made a mistake. I felt like I was too, like it was just not the, the right environment for me because it was very different than what I was used to. Um, I went to a high school that was predominantly black and brown and first gen, low income and Scripps was just a, to a totally different world. The myth is that the admission office did not make a mistake. You, after doing all this work of collecting information, putting together your application that frames your story in your life, the admission office did not make a mistake. Your story, your life adds value to the community. Um, and what I learned um, after getting past my stubbornness as like the first gen kid who had to figure it out all by themselves is 
take advantage of the resources. These schools are expensive because they offer a ton of resources and support to um, make sure that you graduate. And so make sure you take advantage of those communities um, that are reaching out to you as, an, as a first year, mentors, tutoring, um, asking for help is not a weakness. And that I think is the biggest myth that I, I, I learned or um, learned to overcome in college. Thank you all for sharing. So we are approaching the end of our virtual college fair, but I do have a few closing announcements. As you exit from the Zoom session, a survey will appear. It's approximately five questions or so, but please, please complete the survey. It's extremely helpful as we aim to improve our virtual college fair offerings in the future. I also want to remind you to visit our registration site to sign up for additional sessions. And finally, you can access this recording by visiting strivescan.com slash N-O-B-L-E. With all of that said, I wanna thank our amazing presenters for joining me, but I also wanna thank all of our attendees. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.